hello, everyone. I'm joined here with uh, Libertarian presidential candidate uh, Bill Still. He's known for the film The Money Masters. Uh, it's nice having you on the show. So uh, could you please could, kind of, I guess we can kind of start off with uh, please giving kind of a brief uh, bio. And you have a, your you have your bio listed up on your website. Oh, yeah. I uh, started out life as uh, a, a newspaper uh, managing editor of a small county weekly here in northern Virginia. And then I graduated into uh, freelancing and I ended up freelancing for the likes of the Los Angeles Times Syndicate and many, many other national publications. Started writing books in the 1990s. Did my first uh, documentary, The Money Masters, in 1996. Followed up with more books and did uh, the the latest documentary, The Secret of Oz, in 2010, which won the best documentary of 2010 at the Beloit International Film Festival, and subsequently have put out a book kind of on the same topic called No More National Debt. And I'm looking over your – I guess I'm looking over your platform, and you have your, your core issues. I guess we can kind of start off – with talking about uh, the film Money Masters, and it really, the, so that it's about, it's over, the film's over two hours, and it came out in 1996, as you said, but it does cover the whole history of fractional reserve, of the whole banking system, and it covers fractional reserve banking and central banking. So could you sort of get, give kind of an overview where, so where in history, how far back in history does the documentary go? Uh, well, I guess it, it kind of starts when uh, Jesus chased the money changers from the temple uh, because they were jacking up the price of a certain kind of silver coin because uh, that was the only thing that was uh, theoretically acceptable to pay their uh, temple tax every year and uh, goes through uh, the Roman Empire on up uh, the next stop would, would be uh, medieval England, when in uh, uh, 1100 A.D., King Henry of England, uh, King Henry I, who is the son of William the Conqueror, uh, decided that he'd gotten tired of the goldsmiths who are uh, controlling uh, the economy and thereby controlling the sovereign, namely himself. Uh, by uh, either making their gold coins, lending out their gold coins liberally or not. Uh, when they lend, lent the coins out liberally, then those were the boom times, the times such as we went through in, in the early, uh, um, early to mid-2000s, which ended in 2008, and the bust times when they, when they called those loans in just as uh, we had in uh, 2008 uh, to the present day. So uh, since uh, they were basically what King Henry discovered was that he, the sovereign, was not in, in control of the quantity of money, and so he wanted to fix that. Uh, since he, he couldn't uh, uh, have more gold than uh, the, the, gold, the, the combined power of the goldsmiths, who were the bankers of that day, he decided to create his own money, his own sovereign money, which was valueless, and uh, made it circulate as money uh, just simply by declaring it good for the payment of taxes. These were called tally sticks. They were polished uh, sticks of wood, uh, then they, they uh, with notches cut in to uh, determine the, the, the denomination, how, how, how large a stick was. And then the stick was split lengthwise down the middle. The king kept half of it. Uh, and, of course, counterfeiting the tally stick was punishable by death. And, of course, a, a, a wooden stick splits uniquely. And so, uh, you know, it, it would be clear if somebody was trying to counterfeit it. And these circulated as money. And uh, uh, some authors, such as G. Edward Griffin, after the Money Masters came out, uh, derided me on the Internet saying that, uh, tally sticks were not really uh, the money of the common man, that they were only for very large transactions. Of course, Griffin had never touched a tally stick, never seen a tally stick. I'm the only one who's gotten into the Bank of England Museum to film them. And the only one I, I filmed in the Money Masters was the biggest one they had, which was worth 25,000 pounds, and so Griffin didn't know any better. 
So then I went back a second time to, to do The Secret of Oz, and the uh, head of the Bank of England Museum very kindly brought out a, a wide spectrum of tally sticks, including very small ones. And he himself said that tally sticks uh, circulated as money for the common man and, in fact, uh, were 90% of the entire English money supply for some 720-some years. And uh, that's why England, a little nation without many natural resources, was able to uh, create a huge navy and basically create the, the greatest empire of that millennium, an empire upon which the sun never set. So uh, tally sticks worked very well, and, of course, they, it cut the bankers out of uh, uh, making a fortune off of loaning the government money, and so the bankers didn't like that. And so finally they were able to form the Bank of England, in 1694, 1696, I'm, I'm mixing up my dates here, somewhere in there. And uh, that was the beginning of the uh, privately owned central bank system, which we have been under ever since, uh, to the detriment of we the people and general prosperity and to the uh, financial enhancement of uh, the biggest bankers, those who participate in the privately owned central bank system. So do you see the problem as cent uh, centralized banking by itself, or the problem is that the central banks are privately owned, such as the Federal Reserve System? Well, really the problem is twofold. Uh, these are the two pillars upon which monetary reform rests. Uh, pillar number one is nations should not be allowed to borrow. Once a nation borrows, and even according to the Bible, the, the borrower is servant to the lender, because who do nations borrow from? Well, by selling uh, uh, treasury bonds, for example, in the United States, they'll sell them to your grandmother and to your pension fund and to your IRA, but the vast majority of the people who buy government bonds are banks and central banks. Uh, it's, a, it's a little over 60% at this point. So it's no exaggeration to say that the borrower is servant to the lender in that case, and the uh, lender are banks. So it, essentially, the government gives up its sovereignty, and the banks take over the sovereignty. Uh, that's because thereby the banks essentially, uh, through, through pillar number two, which is called fractional reserve lending, uh, the banks have the ability to use their, their money to uh, leverage it or multiply it if they stay within the rules by a factor of 10. In other words, if a bank has really a million dollars in cash, it can go out and immediately start lending out $10 million at interest. That's why bank buildings are always the largest in every town on the planet. They're not just making 4, 5, 6% interest. They're making 40, 50, or 60% interest. So that's a problem because that thereby the banks are essentially, through fractional reserve lending, are completely controlling every national money supply on the face of the earth. So two problems. Problem number one, nations should not be allowed to borrow because it transfers sovereignty to the lender, namely the banks. Problem number two, the banks should not be allowed to lend money that they do not have. This is called fractional reserve lending. We have to fix those two problems simultaneously or we can never fix this and we're going to do nothing but devolve in uh, the middle class of the United States and every nation is going to devolve back into a state of serfdom. Yeah, one thing I have noticed is you're, you're going after the problem is the, the financial system both in the public and private sector, but have you noticed there is a strain within the libertarian movement that seems to be just they're, they're purely against – uh, what, what the government is doing, but as long as it's in the private sector, they seem to be fine with letting bankers do whatever they want. Yeah, well, that's a flaw in the libertarian platform, and that's, a, that's one of the reasons I decided to run as a libertarian, because we're, this is really the core of one of the, the major problems. They believe that if you just uh, take all the regulations off the banking system, then everything's going to be hunky-dory. Those really nice bankers are going to do the right thing and cut, cut their profit margins down so that more money can flow into the middle class, and that's not the case at all. They, they've been bad. They have been mad at the United States in particular since the United States won its freedom from England and thereby the privately owned central bank 
economic system. And they're, they're trying to get it back. They're trying, they're trying to gut the American middle class and return us to the state of serfdom that uh, existed when the, the Bank of England was first set up. What is your thought on social credit? Uh, well, I think there are 20 different flavors of social credit, and basically I would rather not even use the term because it sounds too much like socialism. I think uh, it, it's it's all over the board as far as uh, uh, how exactly they want to implement their uh, solution, but uh, I think part of pretty, pretty much all of the variations is uh, nationalizing the banking system or at least creating a national bank which uh, uh, takes control of uh, a good percentage of the lending in the country. And I disagree with that entirely. I think we need a thriving, competitive, commercial banking market. If I go out and I try to get a mortgage loan and there was only one bank in town, or worse than that, one bank in the country, namely the Bank of the United States, then they may, well, might well say, oh, Bill, still enemy of the people. No, you're getting no loan from us, and I would have no alternative. Uh, one of my friends in the monetary reform community believes that this is the way they should do it, and I asked her, she's a lawyer, I said, well, what can I do if I'm turned down under such a system? And she scratched her head a minute and said, well, you can sue the government. And I said, well, that's not an answer. <laughs> so uh, the way I'd rather see it structured is a thriving competitive market in, in the banking industry so that if Bank A turned me down because they didn't like my politics, I could go across the street to Bank B who would be sporting a, you know, a different flavor of politics, perhaps more in line with my own, and they would give me a loan. It's, and, and this falls in line with my general thesis of life, and that is we need to deconsolidate power at every level of governance, uh, wherever and whenever we can, to the greatest extent practical, especially in the banking community. And so right now, what the system is that uh, the big banks have complete monopolistic control Control over uh, the American money supply and the money supply of every nation on earth, and that needs to be decentralized. The quantity issue needs to be pushed down to we the people to whatever degree we can possibly uh, in implement that is uh, politically practical. So would you use uh, – do you think government intervention would be necessary to break up banking monopolies? Uh, well, you know, as a libertarian, I'm not much on government, government intervention for much of anything except the banking community. Uh, you know, we've, we've had essentially banks, uh, running wild without any type of effective government regulation for at least the last 10 years, and look where that's gotten us. Uh, we found out in congressional hearings in 2008 that despite the fact that banks were only supposed to be leveraged 10 to 1, as I said earlier, that's the rules under Fractional reserve lending. We found out that J.P. Morgan and Citibank were leveraged 52 to 1. We found out Freddie and Fannie were leveraged 80 to 1. And we found out that Goldman Sachs was leveraged 333 to 1. And then shortly thereafter, Mr. Obama got on TV and said, oh, you know, we just need to eliminate that nasty old reserve requirement altogether. In other words, 333 to 1 is not sufficient for these vultures. Only infinity will do. Uh, it's a great gig if you can get it, but it's certainly robbing the American middle class blind. One thing you, you emphasize is that nations, you say nations can 